Uh, I'm Shane Harris. I'm a fellow here at New America and a staff writer with the Washington Post. And I am really, really excited and pleased to be here with my friend Daniel kurtz -Phelan to talk about his new book, The China Mission, George C. Marshall's Unfinished War. Um, Dan and I both came to New America, I think at this in the same class That's right. together. That's right. uh, and when he laid out the scope and ambition of his book, uh, as all fellows kind of had to do, and told me about the work process and the research that he was planning, I remember thinking to myself, I'm really glad that you're writing that book and not me, <laughs> because it was really a truly just uh, uh, incredibly ambitious topic that he was taking on and a great task. And I'm happy to say, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting here with him and think very highly of him, it's a terrific book. Uh, it is a really tremendous narrative, uh, a, a, a part of history that which, with which I was uh, not familiar and was shocked to find how unfamiliar I was with this incredibly consequential uh, 13 months that takes place that is sort of the boundary of this book. Um, so uh, just to briefly introduce the author here, uh, Dan uh, was a fellow who has a sit here at New America and is now the executive editor of Foreign Affairs magazine and germane to the topic really of this book served on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff uh, under Secretary Clinton. Uh, so has the benefit of having both uh, worked uh, as a diplomat and with diplomats but also as a journalist and an historian. Uh, and it really informs uh, the, the, the narrative of this book and the richness of it. Um, so what we'll do here is we'll, we'll, we'll talk some about the book for half an hour or so. And then I'd love to ask uh, the audience to ask Dan your questions about things that we've talked about or periods that uh, 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 interest in history of the book. Also, frankly, um, to think about what lessons this holds for our current relationship with China. Uh, in China's place in the world, and we're going to kind of get to some of that as we talk in the book as well. So we'll spend another half an hour or so doing that as well. Um, so Dan, the first thing I want to start with, and in, in really this book, I mean, it is very much a story. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I find that really gratifying, both because I like to write narrative journalism, but it really is illuminating in that respect. This is not, uh, this is dense material, but you've really brought it to life. So I want you to just sort of start by setting the scene for us for where the book begins. It's the end of World War II. Uh, George Marshall, and you'll say a little bit about him for those who may not be familiar with which this crowd, I can't imagine no one is unfamiliar, had been chief of the army and he gets tapped for another mission, uh, this time a, a much harder mission perhaps of keeping the peace. So sort of set the scenes for us and talk about what the stakes were in that moment. Right, so, so to the extent people today, and I presume most of you in this room, um, know who Marshall is. We think of him as the kind of uh, seminal army figure during World War II. We think of him as the Secretary of State who created the Marshall Plan, and it, um, the Marshall Plan is named after him. Um, but at this moment, at the end of, right at the end of World War II in 1945, he's really one of the most towering figures in the world. He's just spent six years as Army Chief of Staff. Uh, he started that job the morning that Hitler invaded Poland, so he's really um, been central to the history and the Allied victory over the Nazis and Japanese in that period. Um, he has this incredible public profile in the United States and internationally. You read what Churchill says about him, what Truman says about him, and they all say some version of he's the, one of the greatest military leaders that has ever lived. He has a public profile in the United States that is um, kind of unrivaled by, by anyone we can think of today. He's Times Man of the Year. There's a draft Marshall movement trying to persuade him to run for president. Um, and he um, has, has this kind of in incredible esteem internationally, but he's been in this job for six years. He is exhausted, and he really wants to retire. He's about to turn 65. And his wife, Catherine, has their vacations planned. And so he has a retirement cer ceremony at the Pentagon, which is a, a new building at the time. And the next day, they are driving out to Leesburg, Virginia, where they have their house. And ready to, they're ready to begin their retirement. Marshall walks through the door with his wife. And within minutes, the phone rings in, in his house in Leesburg. And it's the president on the phone. And Truman says to Marshall, I just need one last favor from you. I need you to do one last thing for me before you can truly retire. And uh, Truman knows that Marshall's going to say yes. And Catherine Marshall, Marshall's wife, also knows that he's going to say yes because he has a sense of duty. And she is furious at Truman um, for asking this in the first place. But for Truman, China at this moment represents a gigantic problem that really threatens his whole vision of what the post-war order is supposed to look like. Through World War II and into the immediate aftermath of the war, 
the United States had talked about uh, the big four powers that were going to keep the peace in the post-war world. So you had the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and China that were supposed to together serve as the, the four policemen. Uh, they were four of the five original signatories to the United Nations shortly before this story begins. Um, and that was how the, the peace was going was to hold. That's how the post-war order was really going to be sustained. The problem was that China at this moment doesn't really look like a modern great power. It looks like a failed state. You have a, a central government led by Chiang Kai-shek, the, the nationalist leader, who is establishing sort of tenuous control over Chinese territory after the Japanese have been defeated. But Mao and the communists are, are challenging him for control. And this is at a time when the communist menace is starting to uh, catch people's attention in Washington. So the combination of this civil war that threatens our vision of what China is supposed to be and the sense that there might be a communist threat in China um, really presents this problem for Truman. So he, um, with regret, looks to the man who has probably done more than anyone else in the country to win the war to now go save the peace. And that's, that's why he makes this call. Um, his charge to Marshall is to go to China for a couple months, he says. He thinks it'll be a, a quick, uh, quick mission, and then Marshall can go back to retirement. Um, he should go to China. He should broker a peace in the Civil War. He should lay the groundwork for a US-allied Chinese democracy that will play the role we expect it to. And then he can go off and do his retirement that he's been planning. Um, the, the mission, instead of lasting two months, ends up lasting 13 months. And rather than Marshall retiring in short order, he um, starts what is really the kind of most important and acclaimed phase of his career. He goes on from this mission to become Secretary of State to the Marshall Plan and then to become Secretary of Defense a few years later during Korea. And to his wife's um, uh, dismay and, and anger at Truman, it's six years before he actually retires. So when he sees taking this on, he thinks it's going to be <clears throat> a relatively brief last pit stop, if you will, before he can get on to his retirement. Does he share Truman's vision of the importance of the mission? I mean, this idea of the world policeman. I mean, is he on that page? And, and, and how, talk a little bit about how, as he sets off on this, the weight of that sets on him as he's realizing he's got to go out and, and accomplish this uh, rather daunting task in fairly short order. Right. So, so Truman is not particularly steeped in the complexities of the situation in China. He's not particularly um, uh, aware of the history. There are kind of these amazing quotes from where he says, you know, I don't really know what's going on over there in China, but I know Marshall can go fix it. And that's, uh, that's kind of where Truman is. Marshall has um, a little bit more depth. He's li he lived in China in the 1920s um, as, a, as an army officer. He had, through the war, dealt with the very complicated relationship between uh, the Americans and the Chinese government. He'd seen the difficulties of the, the two sides and was aware that they'd been in a civil war on and off for 20 years at this point. Um, but he understood this one world vision that had really sustained the US through the war. And he uh, saw where this was important, which is part of why he took it on, knowing that it was going to be such a, such a difficult task. And you talk about Truman sort of not <clears throat> appreciating the nuances of China, but figuring Marshall can do it. And there's this kind of mythology that's already you know, encapsulated Marshall in his own time of he can almost, he can accomplish anything. Right, he can, right. Did he have a sense of the way people saw him? I mean, in, in this sort of the great man status that he had, right. And, and if so, you know, how did he deal with that? So, so what, was, what was really fascinating to me, um, having a sense of Marshall, the, the myth, and having a sense of the way we think of Marshall now, um, was that in, in digging into this, it turns out that a lot of what we, the way we think about Marshall, but also the way people thought about Marshall at the time, um, really is wrong. There's a kind of image that he constructed over the course of his life um, that really was there to serve his own ends, and that concealed what I think is a much more complex and, and in some ways more interesting man than the, the Marshall, the myth that we think of now. Mm -hmm. I love a line that I came across from an officer who knew him who said, um, Marshall is the greatest actor in the army. Everyone thinks that MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, is the greatest actor, but it's actually Marshall because with Marshall you never know he's acting. And that really did capture something, something about this figure. He had created this image of the great stoic um, that people really bought into. Mar MacArthur was this kind of theatrical, blustering, narcissistic figure. FDR called him the, one of the two most dangerous men in America, along with Huey Long. Um, and Marshall was this kind of commanding, self-contained, stoic character. But that was something that Marshall had really uh, created. You know, he, he ultimately, at this point, had risen to the um, highest ranks of the, of the US Army. But 
when you go back to um, earlier in his career, even into his mid-30s, he was rising so slowly in the ranks that he thought he was going to have to quit. And you know, at the time, he was this, um, he was kind of a mess, actually. He was, uh, had a terrible temper. He cursed constantly. He smoked all the time. And he ended up having two nervous breakdowns, or hospitalizations for nervous exhaustion, as they said at the time, when he was in his early 30s. And it was at that point when he um, saw that he was going to have to construct a different kind of persona that could withstand pressure in, in a new way. And so that's where you get the kind of stoic marshal that um, he is at this point. And that really was what people around him saw. So you, you read accounts from some of the most kind of commanding figures of the moment, and they go into sort of giddy raptures when talking about, about Marshall, and they, they especially go into this uh, idea of his kind of authority and the sense of calm that he spreads in a room when, as soon as he enters it. But that was not the Marshall that, that um, you know, you would have seen 20 years earlier. I think most Americans obviously know Marshall from the Marshall Plan, right? right? Name for him in, in Europe in the post-World War II recovery and <clears throat> really creating a model for what American foreign policy would be for the remainder of the century and an idea about how we should act as a great power. Right. But then there is this, this question that you know, is, at, is at the heart of the book of who lost China. Right. Right? And it is something that um, has its most immediate resonance in the 1950s and starts echoing and taking on even new iterations, you might even argue, into the present moment. We'll talk about that. Um, so this is, this is a period in Marshall's life that maybe Marshall would even want to forget. Right? It, it is, in some respects, uh, a blemish, maybe a failure, a very complicated story. And there's, a, there's almost kind of a redemptive quality I, I sense in you approaching this narrative of wanting to kind of go back and really examine this and try to answer the question. And maybe we'll kind of get at that as we go. But, but talk about why you wanted to write about Marshall <clears throat> in this period, as opposed to his more you know, illustrious career. Right. So th this book is really born of my experience going into government and being working in the policy planning staff, which, um, to skip ahead a, a bit, is a, an office that Marshall created when he was Secretary of State. And um, hearing a lot about the myth of Marshall, uh, who is this kind of totemic figure in American foreign policy and military circles, um, but looking more closely at his career, you know, we, we hear so much about the Marshall Plan. And when you work in the policy planning staff, that, which was part of the creation of the Marshall Plan, it's this constant reference point. And you, know, you hear outside commentators who constantly call on you to create a new Marshall Plan for every problem. So you know, when I was there, there'd, there'd be calls for a Marshall Plan for Central America or Southeast Asia, a uh, Marshall Plan for the Middle East, a Marshall Plan for Middle America, we, we hear now. Um, you hear about that all the time in studying American foreign policy. But when I looked at Marshall in this period, this was, to him, an equally important part of the story. And it was the part that was not told, in part because it's seen as this blemish. But as Marshall lived in and as Marshall thought about the post-war world and his own contribution to American strategy in that period, this to him was equally critical. Yeah. It, one of the things I love about the, the story is that <clears throat> in kind of bringing him to life, you, you pretty quickly dispense with a lot of the, you know, the, the mythologies and the greatness. Not dispense with, but you kind of get that out of the way in right. the beginning right. of the book and then really try and dive into like what made him tick. And there's this, this notion of Marshall as... Uh, a logistician as the supreme nuts and bolts details guy, uh, that you know the, the kind of person who would be is wonderfully at home in the bureaucracy and in all of the sort of the depths of things, understanding how things work. I mean, talk about that because that when we think about, it, I think often, you know, sort of figures of this kind of level of stature and greatness, we almost think, oh, they're born with it or it's effortless. And this was somebody who just obsessed and spent an incredible amount of time thinking literally about how people move around and right. how you move equipment from one place to the next, and rail lines, and shipping lines. And he obviously, he brought that to the war effort. And you can talk about that too. But like, kind of focus a little bit for us on this, this, the mind of this logistician now going to be this diplomat. Yeah, so, so, so Marshall during, has served in France in World War I, um, Army Chief of Staff during World War II. And as you read his interactions with the other great figures of the time, what is amazing is how often he comes back to the question of how something is going to get done. So you have these you know, discussions of grand strategy and objectives. And Marshall's always the one saying, do we have enough um, shipping capacity for that? Do we have, how are we going to supply troops if they go to, to this front or that front? And he always comes back to these very kind of um, what are seen at the time as tedious questions of, of how. And that is what he takes in 
to his career as a statesman. You know, I, it's easy for diplomats to talk about objectives without thinking about means, to talk about ends without thinking about means. And Marshall is very, very rigorous in his insistence that people think about means. And as he goes into this mission, it's what he presses President Truman, his boss who's given him this charge to think about. And it's one of the more, there's this exhaustive, and you chronicle it really well, although it's not exhausting, I should say, in the narrative. It's quite compelling, and it moves along. But this, this effort that he's making to try and get the nationalists and the communists to come to agreement and, you know, and quite literally put the terms down on paper right. and agree to them. And you can almost see him trying to just work it out like it's an equation. And, it, 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 and, and you know, ultimately, you reveal this in the book too, but they're not thinking even in the same way and with the same worldview as he is. I mean, talk about the, the frustrations that he faced in just trying to sort of make them conform in some way to his idea of how the peace was supposed to work. Right, so, so for, first I want to go back to the, the moment when it seems, when he first gets there. So he, he gets this charge from Truman, he flies to Chongqing, which had been the wartime um, Chinese capital. It is a country that's been under Japanese occupation for you know, various parts of it for, for more than a decade. Um, eight years of, of full occupation, or almost full occupation, and the toll of that is just staggering. So the, you know, something like 20 million people have died, 80 million people displaced, railways are destroyed, roads are destroyed. So he's really arriving in this um, really sort of war-ruined land. And he gets there, and because of who he is, he throws himself into this mission um, with the kind of commitment that he brought to the war effort. And he, he, he writes his letters home, telling his wife and friends that he is working as, he, as hard as he had been during the war, which is quite a statement given what he was contending with as Army Chief of Staff during World War II. And he, he remarkably quickly seems to get these agreements. He gets an agreement between the nationalists and communists to, um, to stop fighting. He gets an agreement between them to merge their gigantic armies that have been at war on and off for 20 years. And he, um, in some ways most remarkably, given where history ended up, gets them to accept um, what is essentially a kind of democratic constitution for China. He drafts a bill of rights and hands it to Chiang Kai-shek and says, hey, this should be the, the basis for a, a constitution. And he gets the two sides to agree to go into a, a government together. And there's this kind of amazing moment when you see even Marshall really swept up in this vision of what of what China can be. He's a pretty hard-headed character as he goes. He's under no illusions about the difficulty of what he's contending with. But as he starts to get these agreements, you see him um, really get caught up in this kind of democratic evangelizing fervor, which is very, very, very American, but had not been part of Marshall's um, DNA up to that point. And so he, you, know, you see him um, reading Benjamin Franklin speeches to these kind of Chinese who, who must have been just sort of confused why he was doing it. You see him um, at one point having a conversation with the director, Frank Capra, who's about to start filming It's a Wonderful Life. And, and Marshall asks him to uh, produce a series of short films to teach the Chinese people how to be Democrats, mm -hmm. um, which sounds like some of the kind of worst caricatures of US policy in you know, Iraq in the yep. spring of 2003. Um, you see him handing John Kai-shek this, this um, draft bill of rights and saying to him, this is just a good dose of American medicine that the Chinese need. And Marshall thinks that the Chinese are kind of amused by that statement, but you can read the accounts from the other side and they're of course totally furious by the um, presumption of it. So th there is this moment when this vision doesn't seem quite so fanciful and it's, it's not just Marshall, it's people kind of across the political spectrum in the United States who all of a sudden think that Marshall has kind of saved the situation. And that's true of um, people who will later become, you know, McCarthyite critics. It's true of President Truman. It's true of, you know, the most prominent columnists of the time who um, write these kind of triumphant accounts of what, of what he's managed to achieve. And it's right as he it seems to be at this moment of triumph that the world starts to change around him. Right. And it, it, there's this, I mean, you get through the first third of the book, and it seems like, wow, this is going to be easy. And he, you know, and he leaves to go back to Washington for a period. And it seems that just as quickly as he leaves, it all starts to fall apart again. And <clears throat> one of the things that you, you play with this idea in the book is you know, his presence. Every, all the sides kept saying, if only you would come back, right. if you would be here. And there's this sort of sense of Marshall as the indispensable ingredient that could make all of this work. And of course, then he comes back. But it doesn't all work. Right. And it, it, it's, it's, been an, it's extraordinarily frustrating for him and as the reader too you're getting this sense of wait a minute 
this we we had an agreement, we had right. a plan. Right. So talk a little bit about like just what happened. I mean, because it it just almost inexplicably starts to unravel. So. so I think in our historical memory, we tend to think of um, World War II ending and then the Cold War kind of starting immediately. But there is this really interesting period after the war when people are really trying to figure out what's going on. And there's this one world vision from the war that people are still trying, trying to salvage. They're trying to salvage this notion that there will be a cooperative approach to the peace. Um, there are still summits between Stalin and the Americans that are, are, are attempting to, um, to salvage that vision. And at the beginning, China is seen as grounds for cooperation. So Stalin is telling Mao, look, you can't win. I don't want trouble. You really need to cooperate with Marshall. The Americans are telling the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek, you've really got to cooperate. As the months go on, we start to see the first signs of the Cold War, what becomes the Cold War. So right as Marshall is at what seems to be uh, the pinnacle of, of his success, he goes on this tour of China, and he spends several days going to all these places that had been war-torn for years and years, and going and kind of sitting down with commanders from both sides and working out a peace, kind of location by location. And in the kind of culminating stop, he goes to Yan'an, which has been the desolate communist headquarters for um, almost a decade. It's where the Long March ended, and it's this incredibly barren, remote place, kind of guarded by ravines where the communists have been living in these caves that are dug out of the mountains. And Marshall lands there and meets Mao and has this 24-hour visit with the communist leadership that is kind of incredibly eerie and bizarre in retrospect because you see them sitting there kind of talking about this future of peace and, and friendship. And you see um, the communists giving orders to, you know, kind of sincere orders for this moment to um, their followers to start pursuing their goals politically. You know, they've not given up on the idea of revolution, but it's seen as a political path at this point. You see um, communist leaders talking about what roles they're going to have in a government led by, by Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, now with Marshall talks about, you know, the communist embrace of US style democracy and free enterprise. And um, Mao is talking about how eager he is to visit the US and learn from the American experience. But right as, as this is happening, the same day that Marshall is in, in Yan'an having these conversations, the communists are also watching um, a visit to the United States by Winston Churchill. And on this same day, Churchill goes to Fulton, Missouri, where he gives what becomes a very, very famous speech talking about the Iron Curtain falling between the West and, and the communist worlds. And the Iron Curtain that Churchill talks about is in Europe at the time, but the, the communists in, in China see this, Stalin sees this, John Kai-shek sees this, and they all realize that the one world vision is starting to come apart and there is a very different world starting to take shape. And that's really when Marshall starts to struggle. Yeah, and you can, and you can feel it in the book how quickly things start changing. Right. I mean, day by day, week by week, and, right. and he has a real sense of that, too. And, and, and you're right that people at the time say, if only Marshall came back, right. he could start. He, he, goes to, he goes to Washington to um, get a gigantic aid package for right. this new unified China. It's going to a Marshall Plan for China. And as he's doing that, as he's lobbying Congress for support, things start to fall apart, and everyone says, bring Marshall back, he'll fix it, and he comes back, but it's not as easy as he thinks. Right, and he keeps using the, th the threat of him leaving again as the sort of the stick to try to bring, bring right, people right, right, right. back to the table, and, you know, and, and really, I mean, in very dramatic fashion, sort of waits really until quite the last minute to sort of give the final ultimatum of, you know, uh, uh, either you do it, you know, you stick to the agreements or I'm leaving. There's this, this wonderful scene, I'll have you recount it, uh, with uh, Zhou Enlai, who is on the, the, the main communist interlocutor in this, uh, where he surprises him uh, at a meeting. Uh, but t tell the story, because yeah, it's so, so illustrative, but also yeah. the, the theatrical qualities that Marshall had, too. So, 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 so Zhou Enlai is this you know, really fascinating figure. He's um, one of Mao's lieutenants and is really the kind of chief diplomat for the, um, for the Communist Party. But he's this figure who is really skilled at dealing with Westerners especially. He's a great strategist and political strategist, but he really knows how to sit down with Americans, with Europeans, and reflect back the expectations that, uh, that, that they want from him. And he and Marshall establish a very, very um, good working relationship at first as the communists are, are negotiating um, and, and want to show that they're negotiating in good faith, or at least appear to be. Um, but that starts to unravel, and, and Marshall's really confused by what's happened. And 
as the communists start to attack him, he keeps going back to Joe and saying, I don't understand why you're doing this. We, it seemed to be going so well. And so all of a sudden, Joe just stops talking to him. He flees Nanjing, where the, the um, mission is moved, when the capital moves, and he's gone to, to um, Shanghai, and he refuses to come back and talk to Marshall. So Marshall gets on a plane and secretly leaves Nanjing, flies to Shanghai, and, and um, has a local general invite Joe over for lunch at his house. And Marshall hides behind a screen, and when Joe appears in the room, Marshall kind of springs out from behind, behind the screen and, and, and terrifies Joe and I and tries to get him to come back. And it was just, you know, you see case after case where Marshall goes to these kind of bizarre lengths, just thinking if he can get the two sides back in a room, um, he can get back to, to where he was and yeah. to this kind of hopeful, uh, hopeful vision that he had early on. And there are these kind of wonderful moments because he's, he's, he's swallowing his pride in so many of these moments and is, is almost desperate to do anything that he can right. to get them back together, including you know, pulling off sort of a surprise visit like this. Um, there, are, uh, there are lighter moments throughout the book, too, and many of them come through in the relationship that Marshall and his wife, Catherine Marshall, who joins him for a uh, significant part of this towards, to, towards the end, have with uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his wife, uh, Madame Chang. So talk about there are these sort of like fascinating uh, stories of cocktail parties and parties right. that they would throw. And she, of course, and you'll talk about her, was this outsized figure, uh, you know, famous in the West, I mean, revered, one of the most revered women, I think, in the world probably right. at the time. And there are these kind of moments, these kind of magical moments where they're going to parties and they're having birthdays and they're having wonderful lunches. And there's a real warmth that develops between these people that makes you stop thinking of them as, you know, not as quite adversaries, but as combatants in this. So, but talk about some of the, the social interactions and the warmth that develops between yeah. these two families. So, so to go back to your, one of your first questions, you know, one of the, the um, things that is lost in some of the history we, we tell about, um, about foreign policy is this human element. And it's something that you feel, or I, I felt very acutely when I went, when I was in government and you see um, just how much of what happens day to day is driven by personal relationships and bureaucratic dynamics. And it's, it, it tends to get sort of flattened out in, in the history that we tell about it. But in, in the moment, it's um, very, very critical to understanding the kind of path of events. And there's, there are moments in this book where if you look at it in retrospect, kind of leaving out those personal dimensions, it seems inexplicable. Um, especially when Marshall comes back as things are falling apart, he brings uh, Catherine Marshall, his wife, with him. And as things start to go bad in the diplomatic relationship, uh, Catherine Marshall establishes this very, very close relationship with, um, with, with Madame Zhang and, and Zhang Kai-shek as well. And this is in part strategic on their part. They're very, very smart. Both sides are very smart about how they build relationships with the Americans. But there does uh, form a real friendship between Catherine and, and, and Madame Zhang. So there's a moment in the summer when Nanjing gets extremely hot and um, the Zhangs go to their summer retreat, which is in this place in the mountains called, called Kuling. It was built by Europeans in the kind of height of uh, the imperial presence in China. So it is these kind of stone bungalows that look like they're in the Alps or something. You kind of go up there and you feel like you're in Switzerland and there are kind of you know, pine trees and, and brooks and these uh, you know, Episcopalian churches built of stone. So Catherine goes with them as the civil war is kind of spreading in the lowlands. She's sick of living in a house with her husband's aides. It's extremely hot and unpleasant in, in Nanjing. Um, she goes up into the mountains and brings with her a game called Chinese checkers, which is not a Chinese game. It is a Western game. Um, but she, she brings it with her for some reason and teaches the Zhangs how to play Chinese checkers. And the Generalissimo especially becomes obsessed with this game. Mm -hmm. So you read these accounts of officers kind of coming up from this escalating civil war, which is going to have these world historical consequences, expecting to have these grueling conversations about strategy, and instead they're all playing Chinese checkers at a table together. Right. And, and Marshall, because he wants to go see his wife, keeps coming up, going up the mountain again and again and again. And it's literally this, being carried up. Right. It's, it's this, it's, it takes five forms of transportation and like eight hours to get from Nanjing to um, the house where Catherine is. And you see him kind of going up the mountain again and again and again. He's carried in a sedan chair, 3,500 feet up. Um, Dean Atchison, who's back in Washington, calls him Sisyphus at this point, because he just keeps going up and down the mountain as things uh, don't seem to be changing at all. And 
you, you, you look at what Marshall's doing, you say this doesn't make any sense, but he's just, he's there to see his wife. And he says at some point, if it weren't for the friendship that she'd established with, with the Zhangs, the, dip, the diplomatic relationship would have broken down entirely. But because there's this quality of kind of couples having cocktails yeah. and playing croquet together, he kind of keeps at it through this period. It seems like, it, particularly when Catherine shows up, it starts to create the space in between which people can breathe. Right. Between these t moments of huge tension and high drama and these kind of, where you can begin to sort of live a life. And obviously people are getting to know each other and, and, and that's, that's really compelling too in the book. Um, he, he, he and Catherine was not his first wife. His first wife was quite ill and, and passed away. He, he had a, um, um, his very sickly first wife who died shortly after they were in China the first time. Right, and they married when they were in their late 40s, right? Right, right. So talk about the, maybe a little bit about the role that you know, Catherine plays. You've, you've, you talked a bit about it here in this period, but too, um, what she was like as a force in his life and, and, and through the war as well. She, she, was, she was this very um, formidable personality in her own right. She had been an, an actress in her youth and had three kids and really kind of made Marshall into a family man. But you read the accounts from the time um, of his, his aides especially who talk about him just kind of softening when she's there. So he's this, you know, very, very tough figure, but the minute she's in the house and is at the kind of table with them, there's just this immediate change in the man. Yeah, and he really, I mean, one of the other great tensions in the book is he keeps trying to get back to Leesburg and to get back to retirement right, right. and to be there with his wife and working in the garden. Right. And I mean, and she's in many ways kind of the embodiment of that. I mean, but her being there at the same time, it, it, you know, it. it strengthened him and gave him some sense of home it must have right right and and it um you know i uh, there's no there's no record of this he's a kind of reticent character who didn't keep a diary but right. um you assume that he went back and, and said here look i'll bring i'll bring you back with me um to uh try to um alleviate some of her anger right. and right. And, she, and she says that he will never say you know i'm bitter about having to be here but she will say on his behalf I can't believe we're still still here. I can't believe they're doing this to George. Right, right. And she was obviously angry at Truman for calling him in the first place. That's right. Um, so you just alluded to this now, but Marshall um, didn't write a memoir, um, despite publishers offering him huge sums of money to right. do it. He didn't do it. Uh, he declined even to keep detailed personal records during the war, which I, I found kind of just stunning. Right. Um, talk about why he made these decisions, and then I want you to talk a little bit about the challenge that that posed for you writing this book when your protagonist not only didn't leave much of a record, but refused to create much of right. one. So M Marshall, I think, rightly looked around at his colleagues and fellow officers and fellow diplomats who were writing, uh, keeping diaries or writing memoirs, and said, this is, this is entirely self-serving. You are trying to um, craft the historical record in a way that will reflect well upon you. Winston Churchill said this. Uh, most famously, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. Marshall would say, if I think about what history is going to say about me, even if it's just in keeping a diary that people will read later, uh, I'm going to screw things up now because I'm going to be doing it with, with that in mind. And, and I he realize that's two gonna, quotes to open the book. That's right. Yeah. So the, the, ep the epigraph is the Churchill quote in a line from Marshall um, responding to someone, a historian, who's saying, you've got to keep a diary for, for the future. Uh -huh. um, he, he knew it would be self-serving. So it creates a challenge for someone trying to understand what Marshall thought on the one hand, but ultimately I came to see it as an advantage and that there's no, Marshall was not trying to craft this story in real time. He was leaving that to others to do. And what made it possible to write this book and gave it a kind of, I think, narrative richness that, that was very important to me. You know, you, you have people sitting in meetings with him all the time. So you have contemporaneous real-time notes of much of what they're saying. But most importantly, and this is probably not a surprise to anyone who has ever worked as an aide or assistant to anyone in any, any field, it's the, the kind of young aides around Marshall who really tell you what's going on. Right. And there, there are two in particular who were um, you know, kind of amazing characters in their own right and very, very different. One is this um, kind of young, earnest, square-jawed officer, um, John Hart Cahey, who keeps a diary, reveres Marshall, and also writes these kind of letters, gushy letters back to his wife oh, in yeah. South Carolina, talks about you know, his fear that there'll be a World War III that his daughters will get caught up, caught up in someday. Um, and then there's another character, a kind of acerbic, cynical young diplomat named John Melby, who also keeps a diary, has a very, much more jaundiced take on what's going on, but also writes these um, letters back to a woman with whom he's having an affair uh, named Lillian Hellman, who's this very famous, 
playwright and screenwriter in the US and a kind of famous figure at the time. And he's writing these um, sort of pornographic letters to her that mm -hmm. will start out with these <laughs> almost like late night text, uh, yeah. you know, I miss you and why aren't you writing me more messages. And then um, he'll spend pages describing, you know, not just what happened in the meeting that day, but what the gossip was at parties and what Marshall's mood was and what the weather was like and what they were drinking. And you get this kind of full picture of the story, you know, the, the official documents and the, you know, you can go to the National Archives and read the intelligence documents and the transcripts of meetings, but um, that gives you part of the story, but kind of understanding what they said when they were, you know, having drinks on the terrace afterwards or, you know, he would go to parties at the at communist headquarters in Chongqing or Nanjing and um, report back to, to his mistress what was said. And that provides this just kind of narrative quality to it that, um, you know, I think allows you to see a different dimension of it. It makes me think too, the, 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 this is not an original thought, but the, the lack of letter writing today cre ends up not having that kind of rich exactly. record. Exactly. So I wonder now what it's going to be like when people 50 years looking back trying to write about this period, what we're going to rely on. Well, they'll be deciphering your, your actual text messages. That's and true. And, you're, and we'll to, have yeah. tweets, so right, that, that'll right. be great. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you're capturing something too in this, in this idea of Marshall not wanting to keep a journal and, and not thinking about how history is going to remember me. It's almost like he's sort of, he's not thinking about the future, he's trying to live in the moment. Right. But he was also this incredibly ambitious person who, as you said, I mean, it mm -hmm. you know, really kind of drove him to the brink in his early 30s that he hadn't achieved something great. I mean, so, but, but he seems to me like somebody who truly was, you know, practicing mindfulness. He really was in the moment That's at right. all of That's these right. times, and that comes across. And, and one of the things that he starts doing when he's in his 30s and has these, um, is hospitalized for, uh, these, these kind of breakdowns. I want, he collapses in the street at one point from exhaustion, from, from pressure, um, as he starts um, deciding he's going to, as he says, relax completely every day. So he takes a nap for, you know, he takes like a power nap in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm. He um, watches movies in the evening. So you have these kind of, again, very eerie scenes where um, these world historical figures are sitting there watching movies and e eating ice cream together. Yeah. And sometimes they're watching, you know, documentaries about concentration camps. Right. Other times they're watching Tarzan movies um, and having these kind of incredibly important conversations on the side. But uh, that was also central to the way he approached problems. Yeah, whatever he was doing, he was doing it full right, on exactly, with his full attention. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously one of the, the, the big questions, not only in this book, but, you know, in, in the history of U.S. foreign policy is this question of who lost China. And, and I do think that in the book you are trying to answer that question. Uh, I certainly came away from the book thinking it sure as hell wasn't George Marshall uh, who lost China, which is, and I think you are, in many ways, and I'll let, let you respond to this, but I think that you are in some sense trying to, this book is very much a rejoinder to those people who were, I mean, blaming Marshall for this, for this kind of calamity. Yeah, so let me, let me skip ahead a bit because, because yeah. I think we forget now just how big a question right. and force in American politics this, the who lost China question was. Um, you know, skipping ahead, Marshall, Marshall ends his mission in January 1947, immediately becomes Secretary of State rather than retiring. Um, Truman comes to see him as this kind of diplomatic figure uh, in, in this period. Um, a couple years later, in, in 1949, Mao wins, which Marshall kind of starts to think will happen over time. Um, but as soon as that, as soon as that does happen, there is a tremendous political backlash in the U.S. And starting really in that moment, but especially in the 1950s, the question of why America that seemed to have, be so close to achieving something else in China hadn't managed to do it and why um, the communists had won became a source of kind of incredible recrimination and, and charges of betrayal and, and weakness at the time. Mm -hmm. And Marshall was really at the center of this. So there's a you know, famous line from Joseph McCarthy in, in uh, 1950, I believe. A he talks about a conspiracy so immense and infamy so black, this kind of communist plot to um, destroy American leadership. That was delivered in a, a three-hour speech about George Marshall, an attack on you know, this figure who um, was one of the most prominent military and diplomatic figures of the time, uh, was essentially being denounced as a traitor or at least kind of communist frontman on the floor of the US Congress. And, and it was such a powerful force in US politics that a couple of years later, in 1952, when Dwight Eisenhower was running for president, um, he didn't defend Marshall. And, and Eisenhower had been created by Marshall. He, he was a junior officer, a relatively junior officer, who was plucked out by Marshall during the war and given battlefield command. Marshall supported him, um, taking over the D-Day command, ultimately. His whole career was owed to Marshall. 
And as he's running for president, he shows up in Wisconsin, where um, Joseph McCarthy is from, and gets on stage with McCarthy, and had originally planned to defend Marshall, his mentor, this guy he looks like as a father, and ultimately decides that it's too politically costly to uh, defend the man who had made his career. So you know, Eisenhower has this moment of betrayal, which he feels very guilty about and atones for. Um, but it was kind of an indication to me of just how powerful that force was. Yeah, I mean, you point out in the beginning of the book that uh, it was at least for a time contemplated that Marshall would go lead the D-Day invasion, but FDR decided in the end that he wouldn't be able to sleep through the night right, if he was right. out of Washington. And Marshall so, would not lobby for it. So. Right, right. So, yeah. if, But for that, it would have been Marshall remembered as, exactly. as the hero exactly. of D-Day. But you, know, he, you get at something in the book that that was so kind of captures in a way of, of Marshall's whole approach to this and this, and this issue of, Know, who lost China, which, is, which, which sort of presumes that it could be saved in the first place, and then we can, what does that right. even mean? Who's to save? But you know, he wrote that he believed that neither the communists could destroy the nationalists nor the other way around, but between them they could destroy China. And he really had a sense of the costs of this that they, for the people who were there. It wasn't just American foreign policy, right. it was the fate of this whole country. Yeah, and, he's, and, and when, in these moments when he um, seems to be kind of battling against these increasingly long odds, he says again and again, I would quit if it weren't for the, the human costs of this. But what he takes away from that, um, he really kind of comes away with two lessons that shape the way he approaches the next stage of his career. He, on the one hand, becomes very, very skeptical of the ability of American power to change the dynamics in China without really fundamental changes on the ground, especially by the nationalist leadership. He is not, um, he does not see John Kaishak as a villain, as many did at the time, but sees him as a sort of tragic figure who cannot do what really needs to be done to change the dynamics. So as um, there are proposals in the United States to uh, do the kinds of things in China that we would do in Vietnam, say, 15 years later, to put in 10,000 advisors or to give, uh, there's a proposal to give Douglas MacArthur control of nationalist armies in the late 1940s. And Marshall is really a skeptic who um, argues against that kind of intervention uh, before the communist victory. But he also takes this sense of um, how power works and the importance of everyday problems to U.S. foreign policy, and that informs his approach to, to Europe. So as he becomes Secretary of State and looks across a whole, a whole world where uh, he's contending with the kinds of problems that he dealt with in China and where there's the sense of Soviet power and collapsing societies. And it's a lot of the things that he was saying to the nationalists in China in the fall of 1946 that he then says, in his famous speech uh, at Harvard about the Marshall Plan a, a few months later. So he makes this decision um, that it's, it's with the Marshall Plan in, in Europe where U.S. investment's really gonna pay off, but the sense of the importance of diplomacy, the kind of humanitarian goals, addressing hunger and job prospects, really has to be at the center of the U.S. approach. And you have to be all in for it, right. too. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it makes me think that he and Colin Powell would have had a lot in common. And I, I, yeah, I, th I think that's right. He, you know, he um, really, it's, it goes back to the question you asked about um, you know, the, the focus on means and logistics. He uh, wants to really look at where resources are gonna, are gonna pay off, where an investment's gonna pay off, and that means um, deciding what not to do as well as what to do. I wanna ask one last question to kind of, before we turn to the audience for, for Q&A and for discussion, to kind of bring it into the present moment. At the end of the book, in, you, in your assessment, you write that Marshall, like most Americans, never fully grasped the negative capability that Chinese, the Chinese brought and continue to bring to diplomacy. And he didn't seem to quite reconcile with this notion of clashing notions of power that were in the end irreconcilable. And in some ways, I think the question of who lost China, you're in some ways answering it saying, you know, maybe it was unwinnable. Um, but, but talk about, I mean, what, what are the lessons that we should be drawing now, especially about China at a time when uh, you know, the relationship has always been complicated, but now you have uh, Xi Jinping. The, the law has been changed in China that he can serve for as long as he's alive. There's really been no Chinese leader with this level of authority and power since Mao. Right. So are we any better at understanding China's negative capability in its worldview today? So we're at this moment in Washington especially of collective dismay with, as we see it, the failure of China to evolve the way we expect it to. And that, I think, reflects a pattern that really begins with this mission in some ways, but also is lived by Marshall in the course of, of both this period and in the aftermath and, and what happens in the kind of who lost China debate. So you, you see what is essentially this cycle that begins with uh, 
um, American projection of hopes and expectations and desires onto Chinese realities and this kind of expectation that it will conform to um, our sense of, of how progress goes. And you see it with Marshall in that early period, but even later, you, you will see Marshall and many others say, look, Democrats and Republicans have a different view of, of how things go, so why can't the nationalists and communists? Or you know, they'll compare the Chinese Civil War to our Civil War and say, you know, Northerners and Southerners eventually figured out how to get along, so wh why can't you? And they have a very hard time kind of understanding the depth of that clash between different visions. Um, the second stage of, of, of uh, Marshall's mission, the kind of second stage of that cycle, is this you know, clinging to that wishful thinking even as the evidence against it starts to accumulate when reality starts to show otherwise. And that's, you know, Marshall, I think, like, like, like people now, have a hard time giving up that vision even as um, reality starts to uh, reflect something else. And then the, the third stage is this, um, you know, the, the backlash and this furor of recrimination and charges of betrayal um, that really continues for a long time and has this long overhang in American foreign policy um, in the Cold War, but it, in, in some ways is, is where we are now. We're kind of in another who lost China moment. Yeah. And um, to marshal that, in some ways, the backlash ends up being as destructive as the wishful thinking. So, so what are some of the lessons we should be drawing from you know, his successes and his failures as we think about the U.S.-China relationship? Now? So I mean, I think to the, the negative capability point, he um, gets so taken up by the success of that first period that when um, when Chinese diplomacy starts to change, and this is on both the nationalist and communist side, he's very, very slow to recognize it. He doesn't recognize that while they, while both sides are kind of um, sticking to the same goal, they have made a decision about a new approach to it. And I think that is something that continues to this day in the U.S.-China relationship. The, the second lesson for Marshall is that the, the, the backlash, kind of what, what you do afterwards, what you do after that wishful thinking collapses, um, you can make the wrong choices and the right, cho and the right choices. And if you make the wrong choices, that can have its own kind of second order effects. Okay, uh, I welcome now questions from the audience uh, for Dan about the book and George Marshall and, and China, so please don't be shy. Yeah, Fuzz. Oh, do we have a mic coming around? Yeah, okay. Well, two questions, or one sort of short, one to follow up on Shane said. It's, I love the, both, they're both about the context, the modern context and the then context, mm -hmm. is what, as Shane put it, like, who owns, who lost China such a hilarious removal of agency from the Chinese, right? Right. It's just like a notion that we still say nowadays, but it still seems really strange in the post-imperial world that there is something we could have done. Right. Uh, but a different, much more prosaic contextual question is modern media environment and the media environment in the 40s, right? Just as a, as a member of the media who studies mm -hmm. it just as much as I do, what would that have been like then? Or could something like that happen now? The idea of the media not commenting on the top of the mountain Chinese checkers games and what that meant just seems hilarious to me. And I wonder whether that has any reflection on the ability to do great things now. So it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, the, the media environment was more similar at that point than I would have expected it to be. Um, you have this kind of incredible array of correspondents who are in China, many of them who are the kids of missionaries who have been there through the war um, John Hersey is a, a young correspondent at the time who's about to become very famous. He's about to go to um, Hiroshima with his assignment from the New Yorker to write what becomes one of the most kind of famous pieces of journalism of the 20th century. But he's this young reporter who was born in China, is kicking around China, meets with Marshall all the time, writes dispatches for the New Yorker. Um, Teddy White is a young correspondent from Time who's about to write a book called Thunder Out of China, which is very much a kind of anti-nationalist uh, account. Um, but he, he is kicking around, and you have this kind of orbit of journalists around Marshall who are trying to figure out what's going on. And he um, actually, at a, a couple points, recruits journalists. He recruits a journalist from the New York Times who's still being paid by the New York Times to serve on his staff, which is kind of an amazing, uh, would be a huge scandal today. But he writes a letter to, to Arthur Salzberger, uh, one, of the, one of the Arthur Salzbergers, who's the publisher of the New York Times at the time, and asks him if he can borrow this correspondent to... Uh, help him write reports. And so you have this New York Times correspondent uh, coming on board. Um, what, what also felt very familiar in watching the, the coverage of this is um, a, lot of, a lot of journalists getting kind of caught up in this sense of optimism and then disavowing it later and kind of asking this question of how, like, how, how could anyone have thought that that was possible at the time? 
But when you read the con contemporaneous accounts, whether it's of kind of young correspondents or of, of Henry Luce, who created Time Magazine and was a, um, became a kind of key figure in the, the China lobby, a kind of uh, real critic of Marshall in the Who Lost China debate, at the time is writing Marshall saying, um, you're, you're, do you're doing great. Thank you so much for, for what you've managed to do. Uh, he would also show up in China and get these secret briefings from, from the nationalists, Henry Luce would, and would say to Marshall, oh, they gave me the, se the, secret, uh, the secret plans and they're about to win. And Marshall says, look, you're getting taken for a ride by these guys, um, which, again, I think that happens in war coverage now as well. Uh, Ma'am, right over here, you have the mic. Uh -huh. I have a question on um, Britain. And what role did Britain play at this time? Also, um, there were Brits and Canadians and Australians who died in, in, South, in, um, yeah. in Asia during the, during the uh, Second World War and Burma and such. And, and um, I was wondering uh, also, uh, what role did Marshall play at all in the development of Taiwan? And could you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, it's a really interesting um, thread in this. Britain had fought to preserve its imperial interests in, in China through the war. And FDR and Churchill had had these gigantic fights about whether um, British imperial stake would kind of survive in the post-war. And Churchill finally managed to preserve Hong Kong. He said, I'll give up Hong Kong over my dead body. You'll, you'll take Hong Kong away from us over my dead body. Um, but otherwise, because of the pressure from, from Roosevelt, much of the kind of British imperial interest had been um, given back to, to the Chinese and back to Chiang Kai-shek's government at this point. But there are all these figures, these kind of British figures who have been around, who are in these cities that are really kind of strikingly international at the time. So when you read accounts of Shanghai or even Chongqing or Nanjing, there's just this amazing array of Russians and British and, and you know, other Europeans and Americans who have been there for a long time, all with kind of different stakes and visions of how things will play out in all kind of um, you know, vying for Marshall's ear, vying for his attention, trying to you know, sell him on one or another uh, view of how things should proceed. As for Taiwan, it's really kind of in the, the latter stages of this book that um, the nationalists start to think about what it might mean if things go wrong. So um, in October of 1946, October of November, um, John Kai-shek pays his first visit to Taiwan and registers its value as a um, as, a, as a, a retreat if, if he needs it. And it's the first kind of echoes of, or the, the first signs of that kind of thinking. Uh, other questions for Dan? Okay. Sir, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, sounds really, really interesting. Um, but I'm wondering, was there any inkling in your research about uh, North, uh, the Korean Peninsula because it wasn't too many years after right. this that, that it really blew up, but was there any inkling that it was going to blow up, and was there any idea that there was any strategic value in the future for the Korean Peninsula? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's another really interesting um, strand in the story. The U.S. at this point is, it, there's so many problems. When Truman looks across the world and looks across Asia, there are so many places where there is a demand for U.S. resources, U.S. troops, and that includes part of the Korean Peninsula, which we're occupying and where there is a kind of growing fight with the Soviets about what the future of the peninsula will be. Um, Marshall at this point is very, very focused on China, but you see American strategists starting to take stock of what it might mean if, if the communists win. And you can see the early signs of what would become domino theory at, at this point. They can't quite figure out what the analogy is, but you kind of see these figures saying, well, if, you know, if the communists win in China, it's going to be like a great snowball of communism that's going to roll down the hill taking out the rest of Asia. Or there, there's a, one congressman starts talking about a, a, a baseball game of communism. And he says if they get to first base in, um, in China, they're going to get a second base in Japan and third base in Africa. And then they'll, they'll hit a home run in the United States. And you kind of want to shake these guys and say, you're looking for domino, like it's domino theory, like domino is the analogy. Um, but you see that, that kind of thinking really starting to take shape. And it's um, after Mao wins that Stalin finally says to, uh, to the North Koreans, you can try to take North Korea, and that also changes American thinking. So the Korean War is, in some ways, one of the, the consequences of this. Is the blame on the collusion between the Soviets and China for the European Union, or how is it? Um, so the Soviets, Stalin has a kind of shifting policy towards the Chinese communists at this point. He is supportive of them and has a, a certain kind of relationship with Mao. 
but at various points, because he doesn't think Mao could win and because he's still kind of testing uh, the boundaries of US-Soviet cooperation, um, withdraws support or tries to kind of restrain, restrain the Chinese communists. It's really as he sees them getting closer to victory that, he, that Soviet support really starts to increase. And this is a, port of, of, a source of huge um, resentment on the part of Mao. So when we get to the Sino-Soviet split, which leads to Nixon's visit to China 25 years later, which would be the, between Marshall and, and, and Nixon, there were no other senior Americans who met Mao. So it really is kind of this, this, amazing, um, this amazing gulf. But when, when you get there, when you get to Mao's break with the Soviets, a big source of that is his feeling that Stalin wasn't really there for him during the revolution until it was clear that the Chinese communists were going to win. Any other questions for Dan? Sure. Yes, sir. You uh, mentioned about the domino theory and uh, you know the, the snowball of, of communism. Mm -hmm. In your research, there was, I have not read about his relationship with MacArthur in Japan. Mm -hmm. So did that in any way influence or impact it? You know, what, what MacArthur was doing in Japan could either have some lessons or not lessons for his mission in China? So, so um, Marshall and MacArthur um, meet a couple of times during this mission. Marshall would, um, he stopped at least once to see him on his way, uh, on his way back to China. Um, the, the difference, which they both understood, was that we were occupying Japan, and in China we were trying to um, coax an ally to behave in a different way. And that is, you know, for anyone who deals in American foreign policy, that's such a fun fundamental difference in what you're able to do. So MacArthur could say, this is, this is the Japanese constitution, and he could kind of do it by, um, by fiat, but Marshall had to kind of try to coax Chiang Kai-shek into, um, into adopting it. So it was that difference between you know, an occupied country where we could make decisions um, without much consultation and this much more complicated situation, which becomes very familiar to American foreign policy through the Cold War into today. You know, how you deal with partners who may not see things the way, the way we do is you know, in part the story of Iraq or Afghanistan right now. And it's really Marshall kind of learning that lesson. Other questions? Sure, go ahead. I would just be interested in, in the research that you've done for, the, for this book and then how you're analyzing present day or lessons for, you know, why, you know, why didn't read, we read that China would not, you know, transition and transform into part of the world order. I would be really intrigued in what you assess that Xi Jinping is thinking when it's when my impression is that transition to more of a 10-year term allowed China to to grow and develop more than it did under the control of Mao Zedong but now he's going back to being a Mao Zedong I just I'd be interested in your analysis or assessment of that yeah so I mean to, just to, to to start with Marshall you know this is in some ways a story of chastened hopes right and of, of wishful thinking um, given up and this kind of an embrace of realism in the aftermath of it. Um, you know, Marshall is, embodies probably more than anyone else in this period, in this kind of time of the greatest generation, the era of the wise men. He is really the embodiment of American strength and ambition and possibility. And you see that in what he does as Secretary of State. But the um, kind of acknowledgement of wishful thinking and, and accepting the consequences of that is, is just as much a part of that era. And so, um, remembering that those go together is, I think, one of the, the, the lessons for strategy today. Um, as, as for China directly, um, again, trying not to assume that we will change uh, China's sense of its own interests, but reacting to them as they are is, I think, the, the lesson that Marshall would take from this. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's hard to know what the direct analogy is, and he was very, very, um, his, the spirit of Marshall would condemn me if I tried to draw a direct analogy, but um, the, um, you know, the thing he would always say is we have to kind of understand how they see their interests and react accordingly ra rather than assuming that we can change them as we think they should be changed. Uh, if there's no last questions, I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask one final one, which um, um, <clears throat> uh, because I'm a journalist today covering this administration, I'm constantly thinking about leadership and we're often thinking about the lack thereof and not just in the present administration, but it seems like, you know, we we don't have great figures like this, or at least maybe we don't recognize them in our midst the way we have Marshall. <clears throat> and I wonder, 
and, and maybe it's an unfair question, but do you give any, any thought to, uh, you know, boy, we sure could use somebody the likes of George Marshall again, or are we romanticizing who he was and what he was capable of to think that if only a great man like that were around today, it would solve so much of our problems? Yeah, so I come away with this from this with, with high regard for Marshall, and I roll my eyes at a lot of the contemporary figures who um, claim to be uh, claim to view Marshall as a role model while so flagrantly ignoring his example in many ways. That said, I think we do a disservice to ourselves by seeing these figures in this period in mythic terms. Um, the story, this is a story of a, of a failure. It's a story of a failed mission and remembering that along with all of Marshall's great achievements and successes, this was just a much, as much a part of, the, of his story of, at the time. And you know the, the Eisenhower anecdote I, I shared before, but Eisenhower not standing up for Marshall, again, is just a reminder that these were not perfect figures by any stretch of the imagination. And just a quick postscript, um, that's an, probably an appropriate place to end, to the, the Eisenhower story. You know, Marshall liked to paint himself as this great stoic, and that was very much his image at the time in history. And he always claimed to not really care about that moment of betrayal by Eisenhower. He would say, you know, politics is a dirty business. You did what you had to do. Don't worry about it. Um, he would never uh, express any, any resentment at Eisenhower for not standing up for him with McCarthy in that moment. But I found, uh, I came across a very touching exchange in the papers of one of Marshall's aides where Catherine Marshall writes this aide a letter and asks him to go to Eisenhower and push Eisenhower, who's now present, to say something nice about George. And she didn't want her husband to know about this. She wanted it to be the secret request, but she could evidently see that underneath the image of the great Stoic, there was an underlying hurt. And that, again, is a reminder that even Marshall was not quite the figure that he wanted us to think he is. Well, you've done a tremendous job drawing him as a, as a full human being with all of his greatness and all of his flaws, too. And it's just a tremendous insight into Marshall and into history. So congratulations. Thank you so much. All right, and thank you all for being here.